Okay. All right. Three, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. Her name is Melissa Cronin. She has recently published a book that I just completed today. It's an excellent book. I highly recommend this. It uh, sheds light actually on a lot of things that are currently discussed in America, particularly Epstein. And she actually wrote a book about Epstein, which was published December 3rd, 2019. It was Epstein, Dead Men Tell No Tales, Spies, Lies, and Blackmail. And also her most recent book, which I read, is titled Predator King, Peter Nygaard's Dark Life of Rape, Drugs, and Blackmail, published April 10th, 2020. So we're going to talk about that. But for people who don't know your name or are maybe not familiar with your books, can you talk a little bit about your background, Melissa, and how you initially got involved in Epstein and then to Peter Nygaard, please? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the program and helping me to get these stories out there and get greater awareness around Thanks. what's happening right under our noses. Um, so I would say my my story as an investigative journalist actually probably begins um, back when I was born. My dad was an FBI agent growing up. So I kind of grew up in an atmosphere of seeing lots of undercover operations and, um, you know, just all of the kind of investigations that he was doing. And I don't know if it's genetic or what, but um, when I got older, I started becoming an investigative journalist myself. And my early career was mainly in celebrity magazines. So um, Star Magazine, uh, Us Weekly, The New York Post, things like that. And, um, you know, people might come, people from coming from an investigative background might, you know, look down their noses at that. But um, my colleagues and I really were always working to tell the story behind the curtain. And nowhere is the curtain thicker, perhaps, than in Hollywood, at least maybe 15 years ago. Now you might say that about uh, Washington, D.C., but um, I started out trying to find out, you know, what was the real story behind the glossy, pretty pictures that Hollywood was trying to serve us. And over the years, even in that position, I was able to branch out on my reporting topics more and more under the auspices of that kind of mission of finding the real true story behind what we accepted as the, you know, the surface narrative of or the known facts of a situation, really digging in, researching, finding source documents that could tell me um, what was really happening in the world, and then I could share that with people. So th that was how I first came across Jeffrey Epstein. Um, gosh, it must have been probably about 2016, I think it was January 2016, right as the case in Florida was heating up. And we were getting depositions on the case just from our court reporter. So a lot of publications have a court reporter on staff that they will just send you court documents all day long. Anything that has, you know, any kind of big name, celebrity name, bold name in the court documents, they'll send it over or something they think might be an interesting case, they'll send it over. So I started getting these court documents about Jeffrey Epstein and obviously, you know, I think Prince Andrew was an early mention in those in those affidavits. Um, Bill Clinton came up after that. Every time we got another trove of documents out of Florida on that case, it was just reading it was absolutely stunning to me. And even more stunning to me was the fact that it felt like no one else was reporting on it. You know, right, like yes. I'm I'm sitting here in New York City reading this document like how was this not headline news? And, you know, at the time, there were filings happening in that case week after week. Um, that was when Virginia Roberts Jufre attempted to join in um, with the other Jane Doe's. They were going back and forth so much. Her depositions were placed in there. Um, the company that I worked for at the time, American Media, um, they published one of the first on the record interviews with Virginia. Back in 2016, they obtained um, her diaries at the time and published those. We published the flight logs. I mean, we were publishing at least one story every day, sometimes more than that. And I just, I really felt like nobody else was doing it. And even more than that, nobody was reading the stories that we were publishing about it, you know? With the, but I, you with know, the it's interesting because I think I read some of those diaries on one of the websites. It might've been affiliated mm -hmm. with that company because I do remember her handwriting. 
Yeah, yeah. And Maybe it was 2018, just, though, much later. Yeah, it was, it was a surreal experience because, you know, what was coming out of the court documents was so horrifying. Um, big names attached to the case. This man was still out in the world, you know, walking around, flying around, hobnobbing with whoever he wanted. And I was not seeing that many other, I mean, certainly no mainstream press at the time reporting on it. And, uh, you know, people even on our sites, the traffic was not good on those stories. Like people, you know, just weren't able to confront that evil at that particular cultural moment. You know, we would track every story that we published, we would track in real time how many people were reading it. And I would prep these stories that I thought were just so explosive, you know, unleash it into the world. And it was like crickets. <laughs> so, so, so you guys and, were really doing that reporting even before um, Brown did out oh, of yeah. Miami Herald right now. Years, years before. And, and, you know, like I said, we published an on the record interview with Virginia. I mean, we did a lot of, um, so this was at Radar Online, which was owned by American Media. So we, you know, the National Enquirer was a kind of a sister magazine and they were doing things. Um, but yeah, it was, it was kind of like an echo chamber and it was a very frustrating experience as a journalist um, because it's just the worst feeling when you find something that you think is really important and something you know really needs to be done as far as finding justice for victims or bringing justice to a perpetrator and you just can't really seem to get that traction with the public that's required to really stoke any kind of change at a larger scale. So, you know, it was 2016, the election started to heat up. Obviously that started to kind of clog the airwaves a little bit. And um, it really just went nowhere in terms of the media picking up on the story, in terms of law enforcement at the time really doing anything. The wheels of justice in the courts continued to turn, but as slowly as ever. And we ended out 2016 without really any, um, you know, anything that felt satisfying and vind vindicating in terms of really finding justice for these women. Um, so to me, it was one of those stories that like, one of the ones that got away in a sense. Um, there's a couple over the years that, that I've done and that they didn't really, people just didn't really seem to care, even though I thought it was really shocking um well you were a way ahead of the curve then because once epstein broke i think everybody really wanted to know the details and still to this day are still trying uh people i think are still interested in that story so yeah and isn't it like such a strange thing to think about like the cultural moment how it shifted from 2016 um i actually left the world of reporting in the summer of 2017 i think a little bit disillusioned by you know, certainly what happened with the Epstein that year by the election and just the mess of the media at that point in time. Um, so I, I left kind of the industry and I started working at a marketing agency. I opened up a co-working space, <laughs> doing lots of different kinds of things. And then um, when Julie Brown's story came out um, and then, you know, I was happy to see it coming back out again and she was getting, you know, further further victims to speak out on the record. Um, so there was like a little bit of traction there. But when he was finally arrested um, in summer 2019, I just could not believe that it was happening. Um, you know, immediately one of my former colleagues, Dylan Howard called me, you know, day of, and we were both on the phone with each other, just like, can you believe this? And we were both like, we have to do something about this. We have to, do a project and, you know, just really go back to all of these leads that we left kind of untied in 2016 and go back to the people that had too much fear back then to really tell the whole story um, and just try to, you know, really do the story justice and, and close it off and see it to the finish in a way that we hadn't been able to do back then. So we kind of reunited the old gang that, and, and we're able, um, you know, with selling the podcast and then getting the book deal, we were able to really put a team together of 
incredible journalists, um, incredible content creators. And we sent people out right away all around the world to places that, um, you know, I always had wanted to go for this story. For example, the ranch in New Mexico. Um, that was the first place that I sent a reporter for our podcast project and for the book because, you know, even in 2019, there had been almost no reporting on what happened in New Mexico at Epstein's New Mexico ranch. Everybody, you know, by the time that he was arrested and, and by the time that he passed or didn't pass away in jail, whatever here you think about that, um, by that point in time, you know, people were kind of familiar with the Florida angle. People knew a little bit about the Caribbean. New York was starting to come more into focus since that's where um, the FBI raid happened at his home there. But New Mexico had always been a big question mark. So we sent a reporter out there and we got so much fascinating information from former employees out there and, and um, you know, people that worked on the ranch and people that had been out there as masseuses and townspeople and things like that. So that was just one example of how, you know, we were finally able to really put all of our efforts into trying to get to the bottom of the story. Right. And, and, that, so, and, and that that uh, ranch is a very important part of the story that nobody really knew about because that's also where they had like the fake town that supposedly the Clintons went to, that Prince Andrew, right. Andrew was there. So it is, a, I mean, I, for one, really just thought it was about you know, Florida. So there's a lot exactly. more. Yeah. So Epstein was a much broader multi-jurisdictional. Yeah. Thing. And and we found a woman out there that had, um, you know, served Prince Andrew at the ranch. So we were able to place him there at a particular point in time that he had never admitted to. So we were actually able to catch him in a lie in terms of saying, you know, however many times he had visited Epstein, we were able to say, well, actually, there was this additional date that you never admitted to you. And this woman is on the record saying you were there. And so that was just one she of the things. She had tons of pictures of too. Virginia mm -hmm. Roberts had pictures of all that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, wasn't it just so, just one of the many touch points of that story where yeah. so much more information came out at that time. And so we released the book, um, I guess it was December I think you said December December 3rd yeah. on Amazon is what it says. December 3rd, 2019. It seems like so long ago, but <laughs> I guess it's <laughs> so not. It's been a long year. <laughs> yeah. So, but even, um, so gosh, we, you know, the story is never over, right? But right. even the day that we released the book, one of our sources for the book emailed us and said, okay, now now that you guys actually said this in the book, now that you actually like went down the espionage road and you guys were the ones that like were brave enough to go there. Now I can tell you the real story. <laughs> we were like, we we're like, okay, so I guess we're going to do a second book. <laughs> so that was just one, um, one source we spoke to that came back and then we were just bombarded with other people that, you know, came out of the word work after the first book and new leads and new documents that we found. And so um, we started working on a sequel almost immediately after. Um, and then obviously I got a little sidetracked by Nygaard, um, but we're still working on that sequel, which is called Epstein Inc. And that will be released, I believe, April 2021. Awesome. At this point. Well, I look forward to reading that. I mean, it's interesting because you use the term like fear and stuff like that. So once Epstein kind of got arrested, a lot of people came out, particularly for the court case in New York. So many additional giant Jane Doe's and stuff like that after right. they didn't have that fear. So I think that's a very important element to the Epstein case, particularly. Absolutely. And it, it's an interesting contrast to Nygaard, um, you know, as we begin to talk about that, because he's he's right now peter nygaard is where jeffrey epstein was in 2016 you know he's out there he's alive and well so for people who don't know like i did i've heard the name nygaard but i honestly knew nothing about him before i read this book for people who don't know can you give kind of a background about his life and how he became be turned into this uh this monster absolutely so I had 
never heard the name Peter Nygaard <laughs> myself up until February of this year. And it was, you know, a chillingly similar experience to my first, you know, introduction to the name Jeffrey Epstein. Um, it was somebody that I had on Peter Nygaard was someone I had never heard of. And then the more that I started to learn about him, the more I was asking myself, one, how have I never heard of this person and what he's alleged to have done? And two, why is this not a bigger story? <laughs> so um, obviously February, 2020, um, I guess I first came to hear about Peter Nygaard when um, there was a story in the New York Times about kind of the background to a new class action civil case that had been filed in New York by 10 women that claimed to have been victims of sexual assault that was allegedly perpetrated by Peter Nygaard. Um, and then also in the same month, almost just a few days apart from that, Peter Nygaard's headquarters in Times Square were raided by the FBI and there were lots of photos of that and things like that. Um, so, I had actually walked by that building, the Nygaard headquarters in Times Square, several times when I lived in New York City, um, and I had no idea. I thought it was a tech company or like a radio shack or something like that. Um, but it turns out he's a fashion designer, and not just that, but an extremely successful fashion designer. And he's certainly not the type of fashion designer that is on a level with... Um, you know, a Marc Jacobs or a Mucha Prada or something like that. He is known, um, you know, somewhat jokingly in the Canadian press at one time as the polyester phenom because he made billions of dollars on middle class women, essentially. His clothes, um, he had several different lines under his name, under the name of his various children, Aaliyah, um, Nygaard Slims. And he made just, you know, pant sets and, and slacks and blouses for kind of middle-aged, middle-class women. They were sold at stores like Dillard's and Sears. Um, so he's the kind of designer that, you know, me as a 36-year-old living in Manhattan, I had never heard of him. But certainly there are hundreds and thousands of women across the country that probably have something by him in their closet. Um, so anyways, like I said, the story in the New York Times broke. I saw the raid in uh, New York City and started doing some more research myself. And again, was just, you know, seriously disturbed by the nature of the allegations and by the fact that they were not being, you know, covered or investigated in a major way. And I really wanted to you know, learn the full story, not just for myself, but also to contribute in any way that I can to getting these women's stories out there and trying to get this story into the mainstream. Because, you know, unfortunately, it is the deciding factor in things like this as to whether these women can find justice, whether there's public pressure or not, or public awareness in the case. Um, so I was able to kind of, I pitched the idea and was able to get a, um, a book deal for that and I flew out right away to um to the Bahamas um and I so I went down to the Bahamas and I embedded myself there for almost two weeks um did you fly into Nassau is that that's where his kind of night guard K was right yes um sorry it's okay so I think that he had like his palace was there, but he was originally Canadian, right? Or he's actually originally yes. fit from Finland. Yes. Right? So he funny. actually, he was born in Finland and um, he was born in Finland actually during World War II. And a lot of people don't realize this, but the Nazis did invade and take over Finland. So he kind of grew up in this very hard scrabble um you know, environment with the Nazis bearing down on them. And the family actually fled the country. Um, you know, they were kind of looking for the American dream and, and missed by a little bit and landed in Canada. <laughs> but um, I think they already had some family there and that's what the connection was. But they settled in an area pretty close to, um, pretty close to the American border in 
he ended up in Winnipeg, which Winnipeg. is the center of all of his operations. But um, and that's where he started. He ended up at the University of North Dakota too, and that's where he really started his business. Was really right. Kind of so he he grew up in Canada and certainly you know showed a lot of entrepreneurial instincts from a young age. He had a he claims at least. I mean that's a a common factor in a lot of the things I might say about Peter Nygaard is he certainly has a lot of tall tales about himself, but um, he claims that he made enough in his paper route to buy his first car. Um, he, you know, sold popsicles, I believe at one point. And then he went to the University of North Dakota and studied business. Um, and by all accounts, he was a very serious and good student during his time there. Um, after he left the university, he really jumped right into the working world and started working kind of under under a man at a clothing company and eventually took it over. And that, that company was called Tanjay. So that was Nygaard's kind of first foray into fashion. And, and he said he wasn't, you know, he, he certainly has a, a flair for fashion himself. If you ever see old photos of him, he was um, very flamboyant, but, yes. but he really got into the fashion industry initially because he was a businessman first and foremost, and the opportunity presented itself. He thought that it was a good, um, you know, opportunity business-wise, and that's why he jumped at it. So it's interesting. It was almost a chance. Um, it was just almost a fluke that he ended up going into fashion, whereas he could have just as easily become the, you know, the king of a chain of, of pizza shops or something like that. Um, so that's really how he started in the fashion world. And he was able to grow his company to, you know, its its greatest height, which was like a $2 billion revenue um, by a lot of technological advancements. So he was one of the first um, fashion designers that had air conditioned distribution centers, for example. Um, he really in a lot of ways did make revolutionary changes to the way that mass market clothing was created and distributed. And that helped him to grow his empire quickly. Um, and, you know, it expanded around the world as a result of that. So even though he was based in Winnipeg, like you said, um, in the 1980s, he began going to the Caribbean just for vacation as someone who was born and raised on the tundras of Finland and then Canada, he loved the Caribbean, you know, almost at first visit. And eventually, like you said, would um, kind of put down roots there in a place called Nygaard Key, which is actually probably about um, an hour, an hour and 20 minutes drive outside of Nassau. It's in a very exclusive gated community known as Lyford Key. And it's like, all the way at the end at the back of that community so it's almost like the most exclusive most gated part of the entire island and um and you know this is he sorry, spent a lot ahead. of money on on it didn't he compete with Char, uh, sean connery for the, the the land i think we found that out mm -hmm. but, yeah. yeah yeah so he definitely um had a lot of rich neighbors down there and sean connery was one of the He's his neighbor on the other side. Um, and I was going to say that one of the only downsides to the audio format is that I wish I could show you a picture of that place right now because Nygaard Key is, um, you know, he, he considered it absolutely his masterpiece. Some might call it a monstrosity. It is, um, I think it's been described as uh, neo Mayans in design. So, if you can't picture what exactly that is, I don't blame you, but he um, he constructed all of these like 50 foot tall ziggurats and temples and Mayan gargoyles and um, you know giant snakes that shot fire out of their mouths at night and cauldrons and just a, a huge, you know, for him fantasy land of, of architecture and um, you know landscaping, for others it certainly became the site of their greatest nightmare. Right. So when you were there in Nassau, what did you learn? 
So um, I think the most valuable part about being in NASA for me was um, I was able to get connected directly with some of the women that were the first to make public allegations against him. So to hear, you know, their allegations against him in their own words and see how difficult it was for them to sit, talk about it and to see how fearful they were even then, even then at the time when, um, when I visited Nassau and still to this day, Nygaard is unable to even visit the Bahamas because there's an open warrant out for his arrest um, on something totally unrelated. <laughs> it's actually a court case about um, environmental issues and something about you know the dredging of his beach. Not as um, scandalous of a story, but essentially he didn't show up for court. There's an open warrant, warrant out for him so he can't come back right now or be arrested. And still these women were so terrified. And everyone else that I talked to in Nassau in kind of the outskirts of the city, you know, there was still that element of fear, even for people who are not directly related to the case. Um, you know, talking to taxi cab drivers or women down at the markets and and listening to and realizing how terrified these people were to talk about what was basically an open secret on the island, you know, seeing that firsthand and feeling that really helped me to understand the stakes of this story. And, you know, it's his, he's a man and his story is one that has forever changed, you know, a lot of people in the Bahamas, I would almost say the Bahamas, because he did have a huge impact on politics in the country for many years. Um, yeah, can so you talk even a if it was about just that, that, can you talk about the politics as well as what he was up to? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, similar to a lot of people know that Jeffrey Epstein was very close with a lot of American um, politicians and kind of big wigs in the U.S. Peter Nygaard did something very similar in the Bahamas. Um, so. One thing that I discovered from talking to sources there in NASA and then just doing also a lot of archival research into local newspapers and um, and things like that, I found like a whole history of um, allegations against Peter Nygaard that he had been paying off politicians and police officers for many, many years in the Bahamas in order to put people in power who would essentially look the other way at whatever he was doing. And there is a whole, there's a huge spectrum of allegations about that behavior. So certainly it's a known fact that he donated thousands of dollars to the reelection campaigns of certain politicians. Um, you know, it's a known fact that those same politicians were photographed and videotaped having a having a drink with him at Nygaard Key. Um, but there's other even, you know, even more scandalous, even more disturbing allegations of that nature about paying off the cops. And then also, um, you know, one of his former employees even told me that she had been tasked with stuffing a fish, a large frozen fish full of cash to bring to the prime minister <laughs> because um, I guess a, a bag of cash even would be, would have been too, um, you know, too obvious, too obvious I guess. Right. <laughs> so they stuffed this fish and then she said they, they had to like hang it in the, in the water until they were going to go deliver it to the prime minister. And, you know, that's one of the more extreme allegations, but there's certainly a pattern of known contributions to politics politicians and widespread allegations that he used his money, his power, promises of, um, you know, notoriety and, um, you know, connections to famous people, to all of the locals in order to try to make the entire island a place where he could do whatever he wanted. And obviously that time has come to an end, but the scars still linger very deeply on the entire island. Interesting. Yeah, it was kind of, he's kind of like this, the power dynamic reminded me of Epstein, where somebody with tons of money and power and these kind of poor uh, 
uh, people who need money, you know, they all need jobs. And him just, and Nygaard really kind of being at the center of it all, it seemed like that was common. But also it's like yeah. the way that you wrote in the book, like it seemed like he was primarily responsible for one party winning, right? In 2012, was it the Progressive Liberal Party? So it yeah, seemed, exactly. And, and they're partying at his house after the victory. And that created mm -hmm. even more scandal, right? Yeah. And, you know, that's absolutely right. It was the PLP and that video, you know, there was actually a video that Nygaard released, um, you know, celebrating the victory and essentially taking credit for it and saying that, you know, I did this <laughs> type yeah. of thing. Um, and, you know, to their credit, it seems like at a certain point, the Bahamian people kind of pushed back against that behavior insofar as he was an outsider trying to buy influence on the island. Um, you know, there did, in terms of the court of public opinion, there was a turning point years later. And certainly as he began to get into more legal trouble, that more and more people were willing to speak up against him and say, you know, I don't want your money or doesn't matter if you paid m for my campaign, I'm not going to do that. That, that certainly seemed to be happening. Um, but you're absolutely right that, you know, having, having these friends in powerful places was certainly helpful to, um, to anything that Nigar wanted to do, even if it were just having a party that was really loud and getting the cops not to bother him. But like Jeffrey Epstein, he is alleged to have targeted the most vulnerable of victims. So Jeffrey Epstein, especially in Florida, was known for going after, you know, girls that already had a difficult life and in many cases had already been traumatized or sexually assaulted even before their interactions with him. Um, Jeffrey Epstein targeted and lured in a number of girls who were homeless or had bad relationships with their parents um, or had been arrested previously or had drug problems. And Peter Nygaard is alleged to have, tar have done a similar thing and really, you know, gone into the slums of the island and, um, and targeted these girls that we're just scraping by. In a lot of cases, um, you know, I heard from women that claim that, um, I heard from women that claim that he, um, sorry. Okay. I heard from, from women and former employees that claim that he specifically sent his employees out into the slums on buses looking for girls to bring to his party and later allegedly to sexually assault them. And, um, you know, he, one of his employees, a woman named Rochette Ross, described to me how she essentially felt trapped in his orbit and, and in that kind of nightmare world of horrible things that she claimed she saw because she had to support her family and there weren't a lot of other options and he was paying well. So it's absolutely, you know, there's a lot of, of similar parallels between Jeffrey Epstein and the allegations against Nygaard and, and that's just one of them. Yeah, and it's also similar in like uh, Nygaard, Epstein and Keith Raniere of Nexium. They kind of created this yes. multi-level marketing scheme where you get one and then you I'll send you out. So he had his tendrils and these women going out doing more than handing out tons of money, but there's also tons of allegations about him drugging people as well, like Rohypnol, when that popped up, that was pretty scary. So uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, he's definitely a dangerous person. Um, so, but he also kind of had this kind of longevity interest. Can you talk about what he was doing in the Caribbean in regards to stem cells? Yes, um, so that is such a, fascinating and bizarre aspect of the story and terrifying in its own right. Um, so like Jeffrey Epstein, Peter Nygaard had um, a little bit of an immortality complex <laughs> and he spent a lot of his money and a lot of his time and influence into researching ways to prolong his life and to prevent aging. And ultimately he even said, 
to make himself immortal. And for Peter Nygaard, that was through stem cells. So he was a very early proponent of stem cell research. Um, and again, like I said, it wasn't necessarily for for you know other medically beneficial uses of stem cells. He was really intent and focused on making himself look younger and making himself feel younger. So despite all the other ways that they could help people, his research was was focused a lot in particular on his knees and, and things like that. He was a lifelong athlete. So he spent a lot of time and money and effort trying to set up a stem cell clinic in the Bahamas and they pushed back and the political regime at the time was kind of against him and the public rose up against him and basically said, you know, we don't want this here. So I write about this in the book about how he essentially just hopped over to the next island and went to St. Kitts and told the government there that he wanted to open a stem cell research facility and um, he would pay for it. He'd bring millions of dollars and medical tourism and all this great wonderful promises um and they allowed him to do that but later there were so many allegations that what happened at the clinic was not really above the board and that um you know they were operating in a way that allegedly stem cells were never meant to be used um one of his clients was found at the airport with a gun in their luggage and there was a huge scandal around that so um, that kind of petered out there, but there was um, one of Peter Nygaard's former girlfriends, a woman named Sulin Medeiros, who's a model. She actually wrote her own story years ago, um, and again, nobody ever really picked up on it or looked into it, but she wrote a book about her experiences generally in the world and then more specifically in a few chapters with Nygaard. She actually claims that he asked her to get pregnant with his child and then to abort that child so that he could use the stem cells for right. his and, needs. And something from the, was it the tube is supposed to be a good place to harvest the stem cells. And he said that because it was his genetics, they would take to his body faster. I don't, you know, I don't know the veracity of that. Exactly. But, yeah. But Medeiros is still around. You can see pictures of him and her together. Seems like she was his, you know, like a model. I mean, it gets even worse in the book as you get farther and farther. He, he had these, you know, he called people his harem. He'd have all these women around. And, uh, you know, I, I bet the stories are, uh, yeah. So what else did you, did you find anything else in Nassau other than this kind of aura or pervasive feeling of fear about Nygaard? What else did you discover? Yeah, so, so like I said, in the book, um, at the time that I wrote the book, there were only there were 10 women that had come forward, um, not all of them even on the record, most just anonymously as Jane Doe's um, to file the lawsuit. And my publisher was really intent on kind of getting the story out right away because it was such a quickly developing story. And we anticipated at the time, you know, there was this FBI raid in mid-February. We thought for sure by March, April, we would hear something more from the federal government. And so I returned back from the Bahamas in probably about March 10th. And then March 12th, here, California completely shut down because of the coronavirus. And that whole you know, narrative began. So my publisher had rushed this book out, but then we haven't heard anything from the government about their plans for Peter Nygaard since February, um, up until about probably six six to eight weeks ago when the federal government introduced a stay into the civil case against Nygaard. And what that indicates, I guess what that is for anyone who doesn't know, is the federal government has essentially asked the judge in the civil case to put the case on ice, to essentially press pause and stop all filings, all arguments, all progress towards trial in that case because the federal government is working on their own investigation and expects that to come to resolution relatively soon. Wow. So I have spoken to the attorney that is um, leading the charge on the civil case, which now is, gosh, up to, I think, 80 
women wow. who are alleged to be victims wow. from 10 in February. Right. Cause that's, you only have 10 in the book. So. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So th- that's what I was saying. So I, I, you know, I've put the book together really quickly and then I've learned so much more since then and so much more has come out. Um, but essentially, according to Greg Gutzler, who is kind of the, leading the charge on that case, um, we're really expecting an indictment or some sort of legal action from the federal government against Nyard to happen, if not within the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, there's an election there in the middle, but um, certainly by the end of the year and, and gosh, really hopefully before the one year anniversary of this, um, you know, of the raid. Right. And do you know, do you know what jurisdiction sent that to the civil court? Do you know if it was the Southern District of New York, the same one that Epstein and Maxwell, same jurisdiction as those two? Um, I believe so. I don't want to misspeak. I don't want to misspeak, but I do believe so. Awesome. Well, we're about 45 minutes in, uh, Melissa. Do you, I mean, can you talk a little bit about the book that's coming out and any other projects or any, anywhere people can buy your book if through your own website or anything like that? Yeah, so um, my website is melissaecronin.com. That's M-E-L-I-S-S-A-E Cronin, C-R-O-N-I-N. And that's actually also my Twitter handle. Um, I'm not as active on Twitter as I want to be because I'm usually like furiously working towards deadline on a book <laughs> this year. But um, but certainly once I, um, I guess once I get, this Epstein thing off my plate a little bit. I'll be a little bit more active on there. And I would say that we have, um, we have already um, sold the rights to the second Epstein book that's coming out. So we expect that we'll probably be doing another podcast around that as well, potentially a TV series or a movie. And then, um, I don't know. It's not the deal isn't final yet, but hoping to do a podcast on Nygaard this fall as well. Excellent. Well, people keep an eye out for that next Epstein book. The first Epstein book has like 350 four or five star reviews on it. So it's very well reviewed. And this book was harrowing. I mean, some of the testimonies of the women are harrowing, terrifying testimonies. So uh, definitely this story is something to keep an eye on. But again, the title of the book is Predator King. Peter Nygaard's Dark Life of Rape, Drugs, and Blackmail by Melissa Cronin. Melissa, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you.